Hello and welcome to the Young Texas and Reformed Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor DeSoto. This is going to be a long episode, uh, so buckle, buckle in. Uh, I think a lot of people do like the long-form podcast, so uh, with that, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, if you're familiar with, at all, the textual criticism discussion, the translation discussion, uh, which I often call just simply the textual discussion, uh, you, you know that it always, inevitably, eventually leads to a conversation or debate around the King James Version. Now, now I guess it is possible that two modern critical texts only advocates could supposedly debate about variants, and I've seen that happen. But but that in itself is strange for two reasons. <clears throat> and the reason I'm, I'm, I want to talk about this initially is... You know, I, I made the claim that it eventually leads to the King James and someone might say, well, no, people in the critical text camp, you know, they debate too. And it's like, well, if they, they might, but here's why I think it's silly. So the first reason that it's silly or strange is that modern textual criticism doesn't actually say anything about the authenticity or originality of a textual variant. So um, any conclusion, uh, you, you'll probably, if, if you're keen, you know, you pick up on these things, you'll notice that any claim is, is sort of prefaced with likely or maybe or I think possibly. In other words, two critical text advocates would be arguing about the age or directionality, which one came first, um, not the originality. So the second uh, reason I think that this is strange when two critical text advocates kind of go at each other is that the modern critical text position is built on top of a doctrine of inerrancy, which states that doctrines are not and cannot be affected by textual variation. So if debates within the confines of modern textual criticism and their advocates aren't conclusive about authenticity and ultimately don't matter doctrinally because doctrine isn't affected, um, <clears throat> in my opinion, that's just a waste of time. It's really just debate for debate's sake. It's frivolous pageantry. So more often, <clears throat> what my audience is probably more familiar with is that the reason you would spend a great deal of time discussing textual criticism uh, is because there are people that exist out there who reject the modern critical text and the modern critical text only position. Most people's introduction, in fact, to textual criticism is typically through understanding it as a sort of debate tool. You know, this is how we defend against the Muslim. This is how we defend against the Bart Airmans of the world and, and so on and so forth. And, and so if someone is talking about textual criticism, it usually ends at the KJV <clears throat> because, you know, within Christianity, we're not Muslims and we're uh, not Bart Airmans. So within, within Christianity, there's, there's really one reason to debate modern textual criticism, and that is because people are still reading the King James and people disagree with the modern critical text only position. Now, I guess there's another place it could end, and that is to make a presentation that allegedly defends against men like Bart Ehrman. Now, again, this is outside of the Christian context, but the only problem with this, you know, if we if we were to say that, you know, modern critical text position is a defense against Bart Ehrman, uh, the, the problem with that is, is is that the time, the sources that are used for such a presentation are often Bart Ehrman himself or perhaps Bruce Metzger or maybe Dan Wallace who just kind of borrows from them. You know, either directly or indirectly, you're getting your sources from Bart Ehrman and Bruce Metzger, essentially. And, you know, if we were to look at the King James Only Controversy, for example, you know, a lot of the important claims in that book are sourced directly from the Alans or Metzger, basically. So between Wallace and White and Ehrman and Metzger, there really isn't a fundamental difference um, methodologically between them. Now, they obviously have difference, differences in their conclusions, right? But if you were to take their methodology, <clears throat> it's fundamentally the same thing. So we, we, we have to be really careful what, how we understand this discussion. You know... <clears throat> the the four guys I mentioned before, Airman and w Wallace and, and White uh, and, you know, Metzger, they all prop up a reconstructionist view of the text. Uh, they all advocate for the same method of textual criticism that would reconstruct that text. And, you know, even Airman acknowledges this in his debate with White, saying we basically agree on every single point. I think he says something to the effect of like 8.5 out of 9 claims in his book James White agrees with essentially in effect to say, why are we debating? We agree. 
You know, there's there's one point of contention, and that's essentially that White upholds that the Bible's inspired and Airman doesn't. And so if you if you were to, you know, supposedly be a critical text advocate and you hold to 95% of what Bart Ehrman believes about scripture, it is only consistent to agree with him on everything, I would argue, which is Ehrman's point in his debate with, with James White, and that's why James White lost that debate. So ultimately, the argument from White, Wallace, and company is no different than any other evidential argument. And when we're talking about evidential arguments, this is how they go. The evidence is presented, and the Christian says it proves God or Scripture, and the atheist or the enemy of the faith says it doesn't. They look at the same exact data set and come to different conclusions. That's what we see with uh, creation versus evolu you know, the evolution, some form of it. Uh, that's what we see with every kind of evidential argument. The, there's different interpretations of evidence. And that's how every evidence-based argument goes. So this is also true about the critical text argument, which is an evidential argument. Now, refuting the critical text presentation for the authority of Scripture is as simple as taking the same exact data and making a better case in that moment for why it isn't inspired. And that's what you're, you essentially see with debates between Wallace and Bart Ehrman, right? Wallace argues, well, you know, this evidence is, is substantial and Bart Ehrman says not substantial enough. So all that being said, the real opponent of the critical text position is anybody who actually disagrees with textual with modern textual criticism not bart ehrman not uh you know james white and and bart ehrman aren't fundamentally disagreeing on a whole lot the people that fundamentally disagree with bart ehrman and james white are people that disagree with modern critical text onlyism so bart ehrman doesn't actually disagree with james white and a methodological stamp from a methodological standpoint they just have different conclusions and uh, you know, the, the, the different theories that Bart Ehrman has pointed out, obviously James White would uh, disagree with things that kind of border on Bauer's thesis and, and other, you know, sort, sort of things like that. But when it comes to fundamentals, when it comes to methodology, when it comes to their actual systems that they're using to reconstruct texts or the, they believe that should be used to reconstruct texts, they're, they're really not too much of a different, you know, so... Not too much of a difference. So if you ever wonder why critical text advocates, and this is a really important point, if you ever wonder why critical text advocates spend far more time addressing the King James and people who read it, it's because those people are the only people that actually disagree with Bart Ehrman. Those are the people that disagree with the critical text position, the evangelical textual criticism position. Arguments aimed at Bart Ehrman are pageantry. If you ever watch a debate between him and Dan Wallace, for example, it's like watching two friends having a nice discussion, not a debate over the authority of scripture. And, you know, further to prove my point here, you know, there, there's the argument that is made, you know, we have to prepare our, 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 our children to, when they go to college for the stuff that, that they see from Bart Ehrman. But the reality is every seminarian is handed a textbook with Bart Ehrman's name right on the front of it. We're giving Bart Ehrman to our to our seminarians, to our pastors, and then kind of propping him up as this boogeyman that we need to, we need to kind of be ready for what he has to offer. And if you don't see the 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 really weird inconsistency there, right? Like like if we're going to prop Bart Ehrman up as this sort of bad guy, this sort of boogeyman uh that that's destroying people's face, why are we giving his textbook with his name on it to our seminarians who are then going to go and teach the people in the pew what Bart Ehrman thinks about scripture? That doesn't make sense to me. That seems inconsistent. So if we're going to prop Bart Ehrman up as this sort of big bad guy, uh, let's not give a textbook with his name and Bruce Metzger's name on the front of it to our seminary students, right? Right. So, if anyone has been curious as to why the discussion always seems to end at the King James from a modern critical perspective, it's because the collection of viewpoints that result in reading the NKJV or the KJV or, you know, some other a majority text translation or anything like that are the primary positions that are actually in contention with the critical text position, not Bart Ehrman. So, in this so-called textual discussion, you will often hear it framed 
in light of modern critical text or the critical text versus King James onlyism. Because those are broadly the two positions that are in contention that people consider worth discussing. And even though there are more than just that, there's majority text positions, there's James Snap's position, according to the, the literature on the topic, the King James Version Only Controversy, uh, Andrew Nacelli's section on it in how to understand and apply the New Testament, uh, the way they frame what King James Version Onlyism is, uh, is so broad that it actually encompasses majority text positions. And, and, and really what they're getting at is that, uh, it, as I think what could be accurately described as modern critical text onlyism. You know, and, and I, I've talked about the fact that onlyism isn't a bad thing. Right, like if you're correct, onlyism is not a bad thing. the The interesting thing, though, is when they kind of you know prop this onlyist thing up as sort of a bad idea. It's like a bad thing, but um, you know, so I don't use that sort of polemically. I just use it like they only think that modern critical text Bibles should be used. That's ultimately what they're presenting. Uh, and anyway, so th that's what the discussion is. It's modern critical text versus everything else and when i say modern critical text i mean what is generally represented by the nestle lawn ubs text right now i'm going to try to explain why the way this conversation is typically framed is actually quite bad if someone were to say and they do say very often king james onlyism is wrong right that's like one of the least controversial things to say in evangelical christianity uh, the problem with that is that uh, that can mean an array of different things. That that's not a specific statement. You're not actually presenting anything particular when you make that claim, make that assertion. And this is where the problem is. Simply saying the words King James onlyism and then arguing against that broad, vague term is incredibly imprecise. And therefore, it leads to confusion and chaos. It always does, inevitably. And so, you know, an, an example of another topic where terms actually mean something, we have Arminianism and Calvinism. We know exactly what's being discussed, and that makes the conversation able to occur, take place. But when somebody argues against King James onlyism, there are at least five different things that they could possibly be talking about. So, I mean, everything from grandma who just likes the King James to the people that believe it's re-inspired, all of, the, you know, and in between the majority text position somehow is involved in that. You know, those are three very different things. And we're just fine, you know, we're just fine calling that all King James onlyism. And, and so you can see how if we're just using that term broadly, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, it, it's categorically broad and confused and, and blended. So immediately, because the argument could mean, you know, five, six, seven different things, if there isn't any clarification on what the person means by King James onlyism, and there almost never is, the conversation's not going to go anywhere. You're not going to find common understanding. You're, you're not going to have a meaningful dialogue with this person. You know, I, I've heard on more charitable videos that I've watched, uh, a distinction made between like mainstream King James onlyism and radical King James onlyism, but even that's vague when it comes to how they're defining mainstream King James onlyism, and and even then, you know, they they don't they don't have a uh, a very adequate explanation as to why that's even that bad of a thing to be if you were. But what usually happens is a presentation on the modern critical text against the King James and a presentation on the modern critical text is going to sound a lot like Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman talking almost inevitably. It always does, which means that, and, and this is what I wanted to talk about in the spot podcast specifically related to categories. If we're making an argument of the modern critical text against the King James, we're already categorically using two different spaces there. Um, we're, we're talking about an underlying text platform, the original language text, and we're comparing it to an English translation of a original language of an original language text. So that's categor categorically confused, plain and simple. You, uh, 
you can't argue that a text platform is better than a translation of a text platform because they're entirely two different things. But in the context of this discussion, there are constantly issues with this sort of thing happening, which only serves to add chaos into the mix. So my hope and my goal with this episode is to kind of train my audience how to identify these category confusions, to spot them, and to understand how to uh, argue in the middle of it. You know, how do you keep the conversation pointed in a direction that's going to uh, actually go somewhere? So as a result, I think of the sloppy scholarship of, of James White uh, mo most significantly. Uh, the conversation is almost never precise, never clear, and therefore never ending and very chaotic and very divisive. Uh, and in, for in order to fix this, we have to put meaning back into the words category and consistency and meaningful. You know, when someone says that, you know, that they're, they're, they're so concerned with a meaningful argument or that categories really matter uh, and consistency is really important. And then they go on to compare a Greek text to an English translation. You know they don't actually mean what they're saying. Either that or they, they don't even understand that that's what they're doing. Which, which shows that they don't really care about categories. They're not concerned with consistency. They're, they're using these words as a verbal bludgeon to make people think that because they've asserted consistency that they're actually being consistent. And now... One kind of side note, and I think this is sort of a discernment tool here, conservatives, both politically and, and religiously, they're, they're typically not in favor of muddying the value of words, uh, of, of changing the meaning of words, of using different, of using words differently than their main, you know, the mainstream definition is used um, as. But we see this done all the time within the context of the textual criticism discussion. All the time, all the time, this is done. And so, you know, people that that are that are so-called evangelical conservative evangelicals do this constantly, where they change the meaning of words, they shift definitions, they uh, they they do these sort of moving the goalposts, bait and switch, that sort of thing. But let me give two two examples of why consistency and categories are important, and why I think they're misunderstood a lot of the time. So the critical text position claims that their text is a reconstructed text of the earliest surviving or extant manuscripts. The critical text position does not claim in any book or academic journal or piece of literature to be the original as, as written by the prophets and apostolic writers. There are no texts, as far as I'm aware, that will claim that that's the case. So... This is because their methods are admitted, admittedly evidence-based, and there is not any evidence that ties the this you know initial reconstruction to the original authentic text. Um, this is what I've described before, and what they call the methodological gap. There's a there's a gap that their methodology can't account for because of the space between the original and the earliest surviving manuscripts. And so therefore, while a critical text advocate might say that some readings are likely original, probably original, maybe, might be, so forth, that's speculative and by no means proves or establishes a reading. And if we're being honest and we're being careful and we're being specific and precise, uh, as a Christian, you don't want a Bible that is likely God's word. And I'm, as far as I'm aware of, there aren't any doctrinal statements that hinge on the reality of God's word being likely original. Um, and uh, so, you know, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a big problem when their methodology makes likely claims, but our theology makes claims of certainty about God's word. The word of the Bible is the very word of God. That's, that's theologically conservative and evangelical. But the method that the evangelical church has overwhelmingly adopted uh, is not consistent with the theology of conservative evangelicalism. So is it consistent then to argue for the authenticity or lack of authenticity of a given passage or verse from a system that does not claim to address the topic of authenticity? No, it's not. So we already have issues with uh, 
people in the critical text crowd using the word consistency and and you know ha ha providing a heavy emphasis on categories when they don't they don't actually care about consistency and they don't actually care about categories. Secondly, the critical text camp claims that the re-inspiration view, you know, what's often called Ruckmanism of the King James is dangerous because it values a translation over and above the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Yet, the critical text camp does this all the time. When it comes to translations such as the Septuagint or even the Syriac or Coptic or Old Latin, I mean, flip open an ESV to the Old Testament and try to count all the times they depart from the, where they take a translational reading as inspired over and above the Hebrew Masoretic text. You know, the, the, they do it all the time. And so it's not consistent to have an issue with, you know, a view that a translation <clears throat> is more inspired than the original and then view a different translation more inspired than the original. You, you, you can't, you can't claim consistency and then argue like that. So if you want to make an argument against the re-inspiration, the Ruckmanite so-called view, you would then have to do so categorically on the grounds of the text itself that you think shouldn't be considered authoritative over the original. You're not actually making an argument against Ruckmanism. You're making an argument against the King James and why it shouldn't be used, but you know the Septuagint can be in the Old Testament. You know, you would have to answer the question, why is the Septuagint better than the KJV? And if we're fine with translations being authoritative, then let's talk about which translation is more authoritative, not why Ruckmanism and the King James is bad. So it's categorically inconsistent to take any issue with people who say the KJV is re-inspired if at the same time you think that a translation such as the Septuagint can also be inspired over and above the Hebrew original. And so those are just two, <clears throat> two examples. You know, I, I, for one, don't argue that either of those positions are true, but both the critical text camp and the re-inspiration so-called Ruckmanite camp are categorically making the same argument. They're just using two different translations that they're arguing for. And yes, I cannot tell you how many times I have heard people argue for the authenticity of the Septuagint over and above the Hebrew Masoretic text. It's very common. Uh, people do it all the time pastors do it all the time. It's, it's ridiculous. So here we have another lengthy introduction. Sorry, guys. Uh, but I hope we can see then that when we don't clearly define terms and we don't clearly stay in the lanes of proper categories, it's very easy to argue in such a way uh, that that can be misunderstood, that doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't really say anything significant. It's even possible that because of this, someone can be refuting a position they adhere to themselves because they don't understand categorically what they're saying. When a critical text advocate argues against Ruckmanism, they're arguing against the ESV. So there are, there are so many times when a text critical advocate will come on my blog or my YouTube or my Facebook and use a lot of words. They'll, they'll use the words, sir, consistency, meaningful, so on and so forth. But they're not actually saying anything. Even though they think they've dropped the proverbial microphone, you know, they, they just don't get it. The, the argument related to re-inspiration of the KJV and the Septuagint is a perfect example of this. Now, <clears throat> hopefully this long introduction has, has kind of given you the importance of arguing in proper categories. And so I want to, on the, on the tail end of that, define three categories and give examples of how these constantly get mixed up. In, in this discussion, there are three discernible categories that at least I can identify. I'm sure someone could figure out another one, but these are the three major categories that are important uh, that will always come up. And those three are theology, the original language texts, and translated texts. So theology is the most important because it drives every other aspect of this conversation. Any discussion about text platforms, you know, Hebrew and Greek or translations is always... Uh, is always sitting on top of a theological argument somewhere or another. And there are at least five theological perspectives that drive the argumentation you're going to see. Uh, these are going to be very reductionistic. And so uh, if you take issue with, you know, for perhaps how I define liberal views on scripture, just know that I'm, I'm being intentionally reductionistic because I don't have time to go into Bart's view on scripture, right? Right. 
So the first position is that is the modern evangelical doctrine of scripture. Uh, this essentially states that the original texts were perfect, but became corrupted in the process of copying and therefore need to be re reconstructed by the way of textual criticism. Uh, the Bible is inerrant insofar as it can be demonstrated to be inerrant by way of textual criticism. Um, even though there are places where the original cannot be found or discerned, the doctrine of inerrancy states that the doctrines cannot be affected even if the words are changing or uncertain. Uh, in other words, the ideas or the sense of the text has been preserved regardless of what has happened to the words, the matter. The second is the historical Protestant view, which I argue for, that the original texts were perfect and were kept pure in every age of transmission, such that there is no need for reconstruction. The Bible is infallible because the original words and doctrines have not fallen away, the matter and the sense. There are no places where the text is uncertain or ambiguous, and that is why we can have confidence that we are reading the very word of God, God's inspired word. And finally, the Bible bears witness to itself. It is self-authenticating as the word of God and should be believed to be the word of God by virtue of it being God's word, his workmanship. The third is a magisterial view that the original texts were perfect, but became corrupted and can only be considered authentic by way of church authority. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the modern evangelical view. It just believes that the it believes that the Bible's been corrupted to some degree and needs authentication by an external force. The only difference is that instead of a uh, external scholarly authority, it has an external magisterial authority, such as the Catholic Church. The fourth is that in, is a neo orthodox view, <clears throat> and you know neo orthodox folks, uh, please don't beat me up for this reductionistic explanation. But essentially. The Bible bears witness to the Word of God, and the Bible becomes the Word of God when the Holy Spirit works with it in the heart of the believer. So in that sense, it's very similar to Reformed Orthodoxy. Um, but the Bible is both the Word of God, and it's not the Word of God at the same time. Um, and that's, that's kind of the big problem with it. Uh, it. It is objectively just an artifact, but God uses these artifacts in conjunction with the Holy Ghost in such a way that the Bible becomes the word of God. That is the new neo-orthodoxy, very reductionistic, but that's essentially what it says. And the fifth is a liberal view that the scriptures are not perfect, but rather bear witness to how the evolving communities of faith throughout time experienced God. And we see a lot of this informing uh, modern textual criticism with, you know, Jennifer Knust, for example. So if you've ever debated or discussed on this topic, you probably recognize a few of these and perhaps have even seen some overlap between some of these in an argument. Um, so that's, that's the first, that's one category, theology of scripture. The second category is the original language text, the Hebrew and the Greek. And when, when people say Hebrew and Greek, they also mean by Hebrew Aramaic because Aramaic and Hebrew are essentially the same. Um, so it, it is most common for this to be referred to by a representative printed edition. You know, someone will say the critical text, the majority text, the received text, for example. It's less common for discussion to actually take place around actual manuscripts and manuscript names. And let me explain why there are two reasons for this. The first is that printed texts are representative texts of manuscripts. The critical text, for example, is generally representative of Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. If we didn't use printed text as representative text in this discussion, I imagine everybody who wanted to actually participate would have to construct their own text and defend it, which uh, is extraordinarily cumbersome and impossible, I would argue. The second is, is that printed texts were created in time and space after hand-copied manuscripts uh, were no longer being used, and since we don't use hand-copied Bibles today, um, we talk about manuscripts in terms of printed editions. So technological advances caused a shift in the way the manuscripts were transmitted starting in the 15th century uh, in Europe. And so that, that's why we, we kind of have this paradigm of printed editions, you know, it's just the way that history happened. So we talk in terms of printed editions because, well, no one has used a handwritten manuscript in over 400 years in a church. So that is why uh, we, we talk in terms of printed editions typically instead of manuscripts. Um, but, but that's the second category, is the original Hebrew and Greek under, underlying base text. The third category is translated texts. So this category is pretty straightforward. 
this is any text that takes the original languages and puts them into another language. The Septuagint is an example of this. The ESV, the Latin Vulgate, the KJV, all examples of translations. There are two major positions on translations, a modern view and a historic view. The modern view says that it is impossible to accurately translate a text from one language to another without losing you know, some sort of significant meaning somewhere. Thus, no translation is perfectly accurate or sets forth exactly what the original says. That's a very modern understanding of the way that languages work. The historic view says that it is possible to accurately translate a text and is especially important to do so when it comes to our Bible translation. Uh, a, a translation can be perfect in that it accurately sets forth <clears throat> everything the original says. And so that, that's also a point of confusion. Like when, when you say that there's a perfect translation, uh, they don't mean that like the best possible word is used in every, every place. What that means is an accurate view word is used in every possible place. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that, and that's a point of clarification. A text can be translated accurately and still have places where it could have been translated better, but that doesn't mean that it's not accurate or perfect. Uh, you know, th th that doesn't make it an imperfect translation. So as long as the translation does what it's supposed to do, which is accurately set forth what is there in the original. So it was an error then to say that there is no perfect translation or a translation cannot be perfect uh, because the translations can be accurate. You know, just because a, one translation might render something a little bit better doesn't mean that the other reading is incorrect. That's how synonyms work and turn a phrase and, and that kind of thing. So um, it's an error to say there is no perfect translation because a translation can always be translated differently. That's, that's, that's erroneous. That's postmodern garbage. Um, so the modern translation perspective asserts that since men are flawed, no translation is perfectly accurate and therefore no translation should be used exclusively. Now this is flawed for a number of reasons. It assumes that language translation is some sort of mystic, ambis ambiguous, Gnostic process that like can't be done. And if you've ever watched an ESV committee translating a word, it's kind of embarrassing because they're not actually talking about the language. They're like, um, they're using like a lexicon and and their theology to translate, and it's not how language translation should be done. Um, so this is a problem. But it also assumes that where one translation gets it wrong, another gets it right. You know, if you're assuming that a multiple, a multiplicity of translations should be used, you're assuming that just because you're using multiple, that the, that these two translations, like, let's just say you're using the message and the passion, you know, that's not going to get you the original. And so this whole, like using a number of translations is, 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 is pretty asinine. Um, and, and, and to say that, uh, where, you know, reading, reading two in, you know, not accurate translations together is somehow going to get you an accurate one is nowhere proved and nor nowhere is it defined it is therefore ambiguous and is an ignorant assumption or assertion most importantly you know this this leaves the accuracy of the bible in the air and thus the value of the bible in the air you know if we're going to say there aren't any perfectly accurate translations how do we know where the bible bible is or isn't translated accurately it just adds another step to the process of reading your Bible, which requires the average layperson to know the original languages and thus translate the language, translate for themselves the Bible as they read it, which defeats the purpose of a translation altogether, and which really kind of leads people into error more often than not. And and you know this is why I've always argued that uh, scholars have effectively taken the Bible out of the plowboy's hands with this doctrine. You know, the, the, Mark Ward loves to do the, to make this argument that the King James Version takes the Bible out of the hands of the plowboy while simultaneously arguing that we should use seven different translations It and that none of those translations are perfectly accurate. You know, it's, 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 it's inconsistent for one, and there's a lot of other harsh words I could use, but it's stupid. Uh, it, it's dumb to, to make that kind of claim. So... Why is it important to make these sorts of distinctions? You know, let's just say I were to make the claim the ESV is the original Bible in English. Now, if I were to be preaching from the ESV or reading the ESV and I would, were to say the Bible is the very word of God, that is what effectively I'm saying. I'm actually making a theological argument. I'm making an argument about the original language texts and I'm making an argument about the translation 
the argument I'm making is actually setting forth three things when I say the ESV. You know, if I were to say the Bible's the very word of God and I'm holding an ESV in my hand, the argument I'm actually making is that is an original language claim, which is that the ESV committee had the original language text in totality. I'm making a translation claim that the ESV committee translated those texts accurately. And three, I'm making a theological claim. Because the ESV is the very word of God in English, the original Bible must be preserved and available to such a degree that it could be translated from and therefore immediately inspired as a result of that. Now, let's just say I make the claim the ESV is a bad translation or uh, as one famous man was known to say and then get kicked off of Facebook for 24 hours, the ESV is garbage or trash or something. Um, I'm making a translational argument here. I've said nothing about the text it was translated from or even any theological claim at all, uh, right? So there's a difference between saying that the ESV is the word of God in English and saying the ESV is a bad translation, right? One is making an original text claim, a translation claim, and a theological claim, where one, the ESV is bad, is only making a translational claim. So I've said nothing about the text that it was translated from or any theological claim at all. I suppose you could then say a theological claim that the ESV, if it's a bad translation, it's not the very word of God. You could make that claim too. In any case, um, notice how I used these three different categories to navigate through a simple claim, two simple claims, right? Notice how easily we were able to identify what was actually being said by splitting that claim into three and understanding it that way. Really helpful. And, you know, so I get this, I run into problems with this a lot when I say something along these lines. People will respond, you know, if I say the ESV is bad, Someone will say, you know, just because it's not the, the KJV, you think the ESV is bad. And they, they have conflated categories and made themselves a fool when they say stuff like that. Um, because, no, I've only made a claim about the translation because it's just poorly done. The response to my argument, namely, oh, well, you're just a KJV onlyist or just because it's not the KJV, is a theological assumption that I think the ESV is a bad translation because it's not the KJV when I actually said nothing of the sort. So my hypothetical gainsayer who, you know, this kind of comment appears very often in the real world, but this, this hypothetical gainsayer has conflated two categories without even trying all that hard. And the hypothetical situation happens to me just about every week, right? This particular one. So that's an example of why this is important to make these distinctions. Now, more important than just being able to discern weak argumentation, these categories help us inform our doctrine of Scripture and expose weaknesses in it. If I believe the modern critical doctrine of Scripture, which speaks theologically about the original language texts, then this perspective necessarily informs anything I say about a translation that I read. So let's just say I was still a modern critical text guy and I was evangelizing to my coworker and I opened up my ESV and I preach the gospel to them and, and they say, um, why should I trust that book? And I say, well, this is the very word of God. It is inspired and inerrant and therefore should be believed. I've just made a theological statement about a translation that is in contradiction with me as a critical text advocate theology. My doctrine of the original text, my doctrine of the translation betrays what I just said to my coworker. That's a problem. So if I'm a modern critical text person, I don't believe that the text was kept pure in all ages. I believe that there's an ongoing reconstruction effort and that there are places in my Bible that are translated from uncertain texts. Further, I don't believe that any translation has been translated perfectly accurate. Therefore, my doctrine states that the ESV is only the word of God insofar as it translates the correct text accurately. And since I don't believe that we have the original words in totality and that those words can't be translated perfectly accurately, I don't actually believe that the ESV is the very word of God. I believe that it contains an imperfect translation of the ideas that bear witness to the very word of God, which we do not have. And this is why you often see conflation of categories in this discussion and in people's theology. On one hand, most conservative evangelicals have some semblance of a historic orthodox view of scripture when it comes to their doctrine. 
when they say this is the very word of God, that's what's happening. Then on the other hand, they have a view, a modern critical text view of scripture, which says only the ideas are preserved, that we can't translate this idea perfectly, that there are no perfect translations, that there are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain. So then believing that about their own Bible, these same people will look across the aisle to those reading a King James and say, you're reading a bad version, you're reading a bad translation, or your, your Bible isn't translated from the best manuscripts. When they might say the same exact thing about their own Bible and in fact believe the same thing about their own Bible. So we have an understanding of these three major categories and how they relate to each other. We can not only develop our doctrine of scripture, but we can also have discernment for poorly constructed doctrines of scripture, like the modern view of inerrancy and the modern view of the critical text. Now, how does this relate to the King James only discussion in the critical text? I mean, I've peppered a lot of examples throughout, but let's, let's kind of conclude here. When somebody asks, do you believe the King James Version is inspired? Um, we would say yes, because we believe it's an accurate translation of the right manuscripts, the right printed text, or what you know, whatever, um, of the right manuscripts in the case of the King James. Um, we believe it's in a perfectly accurate translation, perfectly serviceable. And what they're doing is they're attempting to get you to uh, say it's inspired so that they can put you in that Ruckmanite re-inspiration view bin. That's what they're trying to do when they ask this question. And they're trying to frame the conversation around their own category distinctions. And we need to recognize that their category distinctions are garbage and are really, really poorly made. And we need to understand what they're actually saying in that question. When somebody asks this question, do you believe the King James Version, which you read, is inspired? They're actually asking, do you believe a translation can be inspired? And the reformed view is that translations are immediately inspired by virtue of translating the immediately uh, inspired and preserved text accurately. That's the reformed view. So if they take issue with you saying, yes, the King James is inspired, then you can just simply respond, you don't think the Bible you read is inspired? And if they say no, which usually when I ask this question to people, they, they can't answer typically because they're thrown off. You simply ask, why are you reading it then if you don't believe it's perfectly inspired? And so if they answer yes, then you say, okay, then what do you have, what problem do you have with the translation being inspired? That's what we all believe, right? You can diffuse that question by navigating through the categories. So because the modern critical text polemic has been so focused on refuting what is so-called King James onlyism, they've actually undermined their own theology of scripture as it relates to translations as well. We need to have common understanding that the reformed position has always taught that a translation can be perfectly accurate, even if some of them are not. A translation can only be immediately inspired by virtue of it accurately reflecting the preserved and inspired originals. So if you argue that there are no perfect translations, you are actually arguing for a view that, is, that says there are no inspired translations, at which point you have to conclude consistently, why read a Bible at all? But this really points to the reality that the discussion has been so consumed with polemics that proper theological categories have been blended and malformed so much so that many people don't even have a good understanding of what their theology of scripture is at all. For example, somebody might say the Bible is inspired, the very word of God, not considering that they hold to this idea of no perfect translations, they don't actually believe that. Either that they are defining the Bible totally differently than how anyone has ever defined the Bible. And again, we're confused because of unclear terms and unclear categories. So the real questions that must be clearly answered are these. One, do you believe that any Hebrew and Greek text is perfectly preserved and available today? Two, do you believe that any accurate or perfect translation exists of that text? Three, if so, which translation is it? If they can't answer those questions, they don't believe the claim that the Bible is the very word of God that we have access to today. They believe that no one has access to the Bible today. And that categorically is a theological assertion which portrays historical orthodoxy. And I hope now that you see why I said at the beginning of this episode that ultimately we are engaging in a theological debate, not in a, critical, a text critical one, not an evidential one, a theological one. Do they believe 
that the Bible is preserved and available today, and is it translated into a vulgar language? And if we don't force the conversation on theology, we will constantly find ourselves confused. And that is why, in my opinion, why the critical text crowd almost always avoids the theological conversation because they know it is a losing issue for them. They know they are not historic, historically orthodox on the theology of scripture. And the way they get around it is by pageantry and frivolous displays of academic showboatery. And so with that, I hope this episode has been great and helpful. This is Taylor DeSoto with the Young Texas and Reform podcast. Uh, I hope these categories help you go out and, and, and develop your doctrine of Scripture more thoroughly, help you identify bad argumentation, help you understand actually what categories mean and consistency means, and you go out there and, and help people uh, be convinced that the Word of God is available, accurately translated, and can be read you know, today uh, on your phone in a hard copy, and that they should read it with faith and believe that it's the original. So with that being said, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And we will see you all in the next episode.